Okay, there we go. So this is the agenda that I already mentioned. And this is the third slide. Can you see this? Yes. yes? Okay, thank you. So dominant publishing models are highly uh, inequitable, of course, They're inequitable in the sense that not everybody can participate. Sharing of research outputs is needlessly de delayed because there is uh, uh, because of the pre-publication peer review. So, you know, uh, I think this is also one of the reasons that PCI was, was founded. Um, you know, um, papers can sometimes languish in, in review for up to a year, while different publication uh, you know, uh, uh, reviewing rounds are taking place and that delays research unnecessarily. Uh, and also full potential of peer review is not realized because very often when the paper is declined after a couple of rounds of peer review, then those reviews sort of uh, disappear in, 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 in the wastebasket because they are not recycled by anyone. And these reviews don't basically serve no purpose. Not only are they not open, but they are no longer used and they're not transportable in the, most cases, they're not transportable to another journal. And very often uh, the new journal, um, these, 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 the, the, the authors decide not to take into account the review. So this, there's all sorts of problems with that. Um, and of course, this, um, this is something that, that Bodo likes to keep editorial gatekeeping, Bodo Stern, like I like to call editorial gatekeeping, which is to some to some extent is true, of course, and the, with, and the gatekeeping is then associated with academic career incentives, which is damage, damaging science, of course. So the idea that we are trying to promote is that there should be much more uh, open peer review, and so uh, basically based on two principles, namely. Preprints, um, authors should share their rights to uh, should sh use their rights to share their work at any point of the research cycle. So they should be able to publish peer, uh, preprints at any time. And there should be open peer review. The scholarly record should include publications and peer review reports, which is basically what you uh, are all already doing, of course. Uh, so those are the two main concepts that we want. We want the full record to be open, uh, the, not just access to the research publications themselves, the, not just access to the version of record, but access to the full cycle of the research record from the preprint to the final version with all the correspondence and the reviews uh, and the, possibly even the editorial decisions uh, in between. So that is what we are, uh, what we like to move, move towards, sorry. Yeah. So these are the five guiding principles of uh, uh, towards responsible publishing. Like I uh, already said, researchers using their rights to publish share, share their scholarly outputs at any point during the research uh, uh, process. How can they use their rights? Well, by uh, applying an open license, of course, to their scholarly outputs from the start, something that we at Coalition has have been insisting on uh, with our rights retention strategy, of course. This is where CCPY can be a powerful weapon in the high hands of researchers. Uh, scholarly outputs, of course, should be subject to robust community-defined quality assurance processes to ensure, ensure trustworthiness of output. So that means solid peer review by peers uh, and, and in an organized way. Uh, and then, so those are things, the, the first three principles are, are principles that researchers can, can manage themselves. Um, in a way, and four and five are commitments by 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 funders and by funders and by universities, namely that all scholarly outputs are eligible for consideration in uh, research assessments. So that is the idea. There is that preprints should be eligible for research assessment, peer review should be eligible for uh, research assessment, but also things like editorial work, editorial assessments should be eligible for research assessment. Because as you know, right now the system is such that the only thing that counts. The only output that counts is the sacrosanct version of record that is the only thing that counts for your research record. What we want to what we want to move towards in in collaboration, of course, with Coara as well and with Dora, is a much broader set of uh, uh, outputs uh, to be eligible for research assessment from the preprint to the reviews to the editorial assessment, so that it's clear that that output. The, that the research that every contribution to the research process is valued in research assessment, and this is something where we cannot move alone as coalition. As this is something where we need the help of the entire research community, and this is where collaboration with Koara and Dora is going to be very valuable, of course. 
Um, the fifth principle is again uh, for universities and funders, especially for our own funders, of course, namely that we commit to promoting and supporting the sustainability and diversity of a scholar publishing uh, of a scholar led publishing ecosystem. So in the ideal case, we want this to be something that is uh, scholar led and something that is facilitated by the research organizations that would be that would uh, uh, join us in, in, in this effort uh, of TRP. Sorry, that was a bit too fast. OK. So, like I said, this proposal was made last year. We launched it, and we said at the same time that we would uh, have a consultation about it with the worldwide uh, research community to see that there was appetite to take this forward and adopt it. Uh, um, because, of course, uh, it's not at all clear whether people want this uh, going forward. And um, so we wanted to do a consultation with the research community and today is one of the first times actually that I'm talking about the, the outcomes of this of this consultation. I think it's the second or third time that we're presenting this and the consultation was outsourced to research consulting and to CWTS, as you perhaps know. Um, and the, the, there were a number of very interesting uh, demographics that came, came out of that. In total, the, uh, they were able to consult about 10,000 um, researchers worldwide uh, over all co continents. Some continents were better represented than others, obviously, but but still, I think the representative the representation worldwide was relatively good. I mean, um, it's uh, it's of course it's 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 of course a sample. It's a, it's a consultation. It's a it's it's a survey. So it's always just a sample, but the the sampling result was, I think, uh, uh, quite good. Uh, and so this is what you see here, uh, representation of the various regions and countries you can see here as well. And here you would see a distribution of responses by, by discipline um, also and by discipline and by, uh, by region as well. So again, there's good representation of, of the various of the of good representation, especially of life sciences, medical and uh, social sciences also arts and humanities, and then other uh, disciplines a little bit less, but still a meaningful response that we can derive things for, from, I think. Um, the, the distribution of uh, responses by research experience was also quite good. We did not just have uh, young researchers, but also some older researchers, uh, which also is kind of interesting to see uh, that it, you know, it respect, uh, respects a broad, a broad spectrum of researchers in various stages of their careers. So now let's go to some key findings of this, um, principle by principle, because we, uh, the, 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 the people from uh, research consulting and CWTS asked them a, a number of specific questions uh, regarding every principle. So uh, not directly, of course, in, but in an indirect fashion, but uh, for instance, uh, with regard to preprints, um, whether researchers can use their rights to publicly uh, share their scholarly outputs at any point, um, there was um, a, a, a good amount of researchers, 45% uh, that still, uh, that consider it to be extremely or very useful preprints to publish preprints. So they don't see it uh, as something that is important to help research reach its intended audience, uh, but they still consider it to be extremely and or very useful, which we believe is is a good enough endorsement of the of of what we uh, of, of our aims and and, and goals here. Uh, in addition, uh, research also shows that the benefits of early sharing uh, sh sharing are are very widely understood. Uh, um, and then also new data that have shown uh, that we've seen that uh, publication as a preprint correlates with a significant pos positive citation advantage of about 20% should encourage more uh, preprint publications, of course. So there is there is a good amount of researchers that uh, who think that preprints are indeed uh, effective in uh, enhancing research uh, accessibility, um, like providing early access, increasing transparency, accelerating academic discourse and receiving feedback. So again, you know, this is a, a, around 45%, which is, is, is really uh, not bad for uh, an academic uh, uh, ecosystem where in fact the emphasis on, on the, the final product is so high. So people do understand that preprints can play a role in the scholarly communication system. 
sharing with an open license that is doing uh, uh, slightly better. People do have understood the advantages of open access. 70%, 77% find open access extremely or very useful. Um, uh, and in fact, what is interesting is that the fact that the that open access is considered more important than uh, the high impact factor is, I think, very, uh, uh, very encouraging, because although people think that that is still important, 70% and 74%, the, the fact that 77% see, see open access itself uh, as, as, as the most important aspect is an encouraging, uh, is an encouraging development, I believe. Uh, so that means that open access is really something that is has been socialized uh, sufficiently, uh, and uh, open licenses as well are, I think, better understood than they than they used to be. Um, peer review. Um, so the would you support the publication of your uh, peer review report? That was the question that was asked of reviewers, and. This was then uh, the need on making peer reviews open to help ensure their trustworthiness. And interestingly, about 65% of researchers would support the publication of peer review reports, which is more than I had expected, actually. If you look at uh, articles worldwide, and if you look at the, 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 the current system as we, as, uh, as we are told that people experience it. So there, there seems to be broad support for the publication of uh, peer review report, uh, peer review reports, and there's only 70, uh, 30 percent of respondents who have negative reviews around non-anonymous non -anonymous, uh, peer review. Now, of course, this is probably going to uh, be different from one uh, uh, research domain to the other, but um, this is this is still a, a very encouraging, I think, uh, uh, to 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 see that there are that there is this positive response to uh, the publication of. Uh, peer review reports in general, um, either as anonymous peer review reports or as non-anonymous peer peer review reports. And as you know, the the, the uh, towards re responsible publishing uh, um, framework supports both view uh, both perspectives, huh? both uh, signed and unsigned peer peer review reports. Um, are, is something that we would support here. Recognition and reward, well. Their uh, respondents really confirmed the need to improve recognition and reward mechanisms for uh, these uh, for preprinting. Um, do uh, do you think that uh, current systems are are taking that into account? Well, the answer seems to be an overwhelming uh, 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 an overwhelming no, right? Or an overwhelming not really. Seventy five percent of respondents feel that they never or only sometimes are rewarding for uh, rewarded properly rewarded for sh sharing and preprint. So there is quite a discrepancy there, I believe, between the people between those people who, who are really in favor of, of preprinting, which we saw, right? I mean, about half of the respondents, and people here saying, well, you know, even if we do that, it's not really rewarded. So that that is something that that needs to change. Um, same same here. There is a, a confirmation uh, to uh, that that recognition and reward mechanisms should be changed to encourage researchers to participate more actively in peer review. So about eighty percent um, believe that peer review activities should be recognized in hiring and promotion committees. Again, I think this is very encouraging because it shows us a way a way forward. Uh, in in this, uh, it it means uh, essentially, I believe that there is broad support for the ideas presented in the proposal. Maybe not overwhelming support, but it's also clear that this support, even if it's like about fifty percent, is really conditional on changing the research ecosystem towards a system where publishing these peer reviews and doing peer review is much better recognized than it is today. So the idea is, of course, that if this is to be successfully implemented, we must, must develop an implementation plan, uh, seek especially alignment between the publishing reform itself, between the insistence on, on, on publication of preprints and the research assessment reform. We need to reward and recognize preprints as full-fledged uh, as, as full-fledged contributions to research. We need to recognize peer reviews as full-fledged contribution to, to research and also develop easy to use infrastructures. And I mean, I don't need to convince you of that. You did it. Um, easy to use infrastructure that integrate preprint posting and open peer review into uh, 
into the uh, into more traditional uh, journal workflows. You did that. You have the PCI friendly uh, journals, right? That system. I believe that's really one of the ways forward because basically what you then do is to integrate the advantages of preprint publishing plus the peer review and the traditional prestige that certain journals can still confirm. Confer, and this is actually something that is confirmed by. Um, that is that I think is is confirmed by what people are asking. People are asking us, please make it easy for us. No, make it. We know you. We want to publish papers. We had literal comments like that in the. We saw literal comments like that in the in the survey. People who said yes. We want to do these preprints, but make it easy for us and integrate it in the existing workflows so that the, that that is not entirely. Uh, disrupted and then of course it's incumbent on the the funders and the, and the universities to repurpose funds that are already spent on scholarly communication to sustainably fund the infrastructures required by the trp uh, proposal so infrastructure is also to just host uh, peer reviews for instance signed and unsigned peer reviews or perhaps unsigned peer reviews with a nickname so that you can recognize uh, the style of a person if you want to see their entire peer review record to see how they contributed to the record. Uh, so there's various ideas there, there, I think, that could be developed to, to have infrastructure that is strictly devoted to hosting peer reviews, whereas the peer reviews would also be hosted alongside the article. Because, of course, if you want peer review to be recognized, it has to be also easily accessible for the evaluating instance, the university, the funder, so that they can verify what the research, what contribution the evaluated researcher made to the scholarly record in terms of peer review and not just in terms of their publication record. So th these are the things that we need to think about going, going forward, I believe. So specific actions that we could consider in support of TRP. Well, first of all, of course, encourage researchers to post preprints. You could also mandate it the way the Gates Foundation did. You mandate preprint, say, look, I mean, we don't care about the the published the published version. You you need to publish the preprint. Uh, that's that's one approach. I don't think that will be possible for all funders, given their mandate and their their national context. It's easier for perhaps easier for private funders to uh, require that than for national funders. But uh, encouraging is a good start, I believe, and especially if it's uh, rewarded in the system. Uh, require researchers to detail their preprinting grant applications and research assessment processes, not only uh, preprints, but also peer reviews, of course. Uh, provide, provide guidance um, to, to assessors, the journal names and, uh, and journal impact factor and uh, names, of article, names of journal articles will play no role in assessment of researchers. That is also already something that many of the coalition S funders do when they, when they select research proposals, uh, remove journal names from assessment materials. All, uh, and um, uh, like I said, in identify reviewed preprints and assessment materials. Um, and then the same, uh, encourage people to uh, participate in open peer review processes and reward them for it uh, and mandate them to list these published peer review reports. Uh, one of the things that I'm promoting is, is, for instance, is to say, just value a peer review in the same way as you do a published article. I mean, not everybody agrees there. Many people have thought, yeah, but a, you know, a research article is so much more original. I disagree. I think, you know, a peer review is really essential to the research process. We have to stop this idea that, you know, there is this single genius who produces a research article and then that person alone is responsible for the research result. I mean, it's it's a collaborative effort and that should be made much more uh, much more evident in the way we, we reward research, in the way we publish research uh, and so on. So financial support, of course, should come through development a plan that decreases payments for traditional publishing models that will include, for instance, also diminishing payments to uh, gold APC models. This is going to hurt uh, and, pe and people are going to scream, but this is something that we will need to do, I think, if we want to make this possible. Make service payments contingent on public availability of uh, products such as pay review reports, uh, support preprint servers and institutional repositories, and also develop support for services that uh, provide pre-publication checks, uh, image manipulation, plagiarism, and so on. So these are these are services, and these services, of course, need to be provided and need to be paid for in some way. Uh, so this is something that we need that we need to think about. Uh, and of course, um, support open post-publication review services like eLife, PCI, Review Commons, and so on. 
uh, and also support diamond publishing models because a PCI, for instance, is a diamond publishing uh, is fits within diamond is one of, is a diamond model where authors don't pay for um, uh, getting their reviews for the serv for the publication services that they they receive. So I I also think that within diamond, actually, the diamond open access standard also includes. Um, as its standard, the move the move towards open peer review over time as a best practice. Uh, no, now this is of course again something that needs to be supported. Uh, open peer review there is still mainly um, uh, pre-publication, so the 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 open peer review is made available after the review process has has concluded, um, and so the the review process itself is is, is closed, so to speak. But um, and there is no preprint. But we, we can, I think, afford a, a variety of models as long as we move towards a system where all the reviews are open in the long run. And this is something that I also will want to experiment with at my own journal, Glossa, uh, going forward. But that means also that the infrastructure uh, uh, at Glossa needs to, be, needs to be changed for that. So that's something that we are working on. Uh, so in the end, I see a convergence between pre-publication and post-publication um, uh, peer review models where all the reviews are open um, and so that we have this, that we share this, this idea that uh, uh, all contributions to the research process should be much more open than they, they currently are. But of course, that's an idea that needs socialization and this is one of the ways that I think we can, we can do this. I'm reaching the end of my slides. Um, now, this is a proposal, it's not yet policy, right? Um, so the timeline is that now, next week, actually, June 24, next week, we are discussing this with the leaders of Coalition S uh, funders to discuss the findings of the TRP uh, consultation. Then uh, we will uh, publish the full report and the data set. So this is something that you will be able to scrutinize in much more detail than I presented today. And then uh, in December, in, in the fall, in October to December, we will uh, publish our response to the consultation and we will decide whether we want, as coalition, as funders, to take TRP or ideas within TRP forward in one way or another in an implementation plan that we will then make public at that time. And then we will know whether we will, how, how and when we will take forward these um, uh, these elements of towards responsible publishing and this greater emphasis on preprints and open peer review. So, um, so this is where I will stop my presentation and also stop sharing it. So probably. Thank you very much, Johan, for this very nice presentation. So we are now going to move to the questions. Uh, so there, there are some already in the chat. So please feel free to add uh, uh, to add other question or to to vote for the question you you would like us to to uh, you would like you to to answer. Uh, we will yes. stop at at five o'clock sharp. So yeah, yes, we because, might not have time because for... I have another meeting as yeah. well. I see a question by, I mean, I'm going to move through the, the chat and, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Um, let's see, I'm doing something wrong here. Chat, because now I'm seeing, seeing participants. Um, so it starts with a question of Pavitram. Narayan, yes. Beyond preprints, what is coalition has stand on pieces publishing, published on modular publishing platforms like UKRI's Octopus? Um, Um, we right, well right now we have no stance on these right. I mean, if these are if these counts as, as preprints, they will they will be um, they will be taken into account. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I don't know the status of pieces of of pieces on Octopus. I know Octopus. I know Octopus a little bit. It's a much more. It's a platform that allows for all sorts of contributions to be made, and not 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 let's say the traditional preprint. And this is something that we would need to discuss within coalition as in our implementation. This is a good question, actually. I don't know, but I'm sure that our uh, UKRI colleagues will will bring that into the discussion when we when when we come to it. Um, is that an, a sufficient answer? 
Pavitram, do, do come in if you if you want me to comment more on this. Um, otherwise, Denis is asking a question for the publication of peer reviews, for which Arthur have this was for positive reviews. Yes, uh, this is actually a discussion that we're still having, Denis, <laughs> in the coalition as I mean a number of a number of um, people in coalition S think that they also negative peer reviews should be published. I am, as, as you know, we have had this discussion <laughs> privately. As you know, I am not myself all too keen on that because we want to avoid a negative stigma uh, on researchers with respect to negative peer reviews, right? And an initial negative peer review may simply be due to a lack of experience of the of the authors. This is also something that I see with my journal. You have people who submit to the journal who have, don't have very good supervisors, and then they submit work that is subpar, not because they are subpar, but simply because they are not well supervised. And I, I don't think I, we would want, uh, you know, so, sort of collectively to, to, to sort of brand these researchers as bad researchers simply because they have they, they come from a tradition where their supervision is not 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 good. So you want to sort of protect them from this kind of negative stigma, I, I believe. But this is a discussion that we still need to have. Um, uh, and, um, and and like I said, opinions are divided. There are those who are principled and orthodox and say, no, no, all negative peer reviews should be published and let's, let the chips fall where they may. And there are those of us who are more, uh, yeah, who have been in publishing perhaps, uh, you know, have, have their feet in the muddy ground of actual publishing and say, look, sometimes it's wise to protect researchers against themselves <laughs> and not to expose them uh, for, for their lack of experience. Uh, how, how the survey was disseminated. I don't, yes, I know how the first survey was disseminated. It was disseminated by using the orchids of uh, uh, thousands of researchers worldwide and sending it around and see who responded. So there is, uh, there was no bias towards open access advocate, uh, advocates. Now, of course, there could be a bias in the sense that those people, um, those people who were already open access advocates felt more inclined to, uh, to, to respond. That is always a possibility. I, I don't think that's something that you can actually uh, avoid. Um, but um, I would refer, refer you to the full report, report with it, which is coming out uh, soon enough. Then Edson Oliveira has question one, how are you dealing with research artifact from computer science, codes, programming, language, script, etc.? Um, well, for now, we, we are not dealing with that. Actually, we have really focused uh, on, uh, uh, we have really decided to focus on Reprints uh, and uh, reprints and peer reviews primarily. Uh, we of course would like to have. Uh, we, we would like it. We would like that any other products are also openly available. But that is not our focus here because we can't do everything. For instance, people have often asked us, "What about open data?" Well, we are not going to do something about open data in this proposal. Uh, personally, I think that is something that should be taken care of at the level of the journal. Uh, the journal policies. I mean, my journal, for instance, you don't get published if the data are not open. It's that simple. Uh, so it's the first question that asks that submission. Are your data available? Where can I see them? Where can I see the protocols? If we, the, the author cannot assure us that they will be available or available at the time of publication, we simply don't review the paper. If more journals did that, we would have a lot of more open data. Um, but for for indeed for so, for certain outputs like, like you say this is not this is um, this is more difficult uh, um, so I don't have that um, uh, I don't have that yeah I, I I don't I'm not I'm not sure what we should do there but we are certainly in favor of making it as open as possible. Going back to the founding principle for Coalition S, curious about the tension between reducing editorial gatekeeping, but yeah. I'm not sure I understand the question. But also beefing up community-defined quality assurance processes. I understand these two functions, editors versus peer to be distinct. Katie, can, can you come in? Can you? 
open up your mic and explain to me because I'm not sure that I understand here. What's your question? You may be able to unmute Ketchy. Oh, Parker. yes. Hi. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Yes. Sorry. Uh, so my my question, you had this slide at the beginning that was saying something like one yes. of the one of the flaws with traditional publishing is that there's this editorial gatekeeping that we need to avoid. And then on the very next slide, uh, talked about sort of the importance of the peer review process for developing uh, or for um, mm. protecting our the quality of research and so it's sort of this juxtaposition where it seemed to me that the the editors and the peers at least in the community that I come from are not so distinct so I was sort of confused no. about how no, but the editor, hand, we, yeah what we mean by the editorial gatekeeping is, is I mean this is actually a term that we should change because I mean a lot of people don't like it myself included um I think what we mean by that is that you know it's the 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 editors I mean the decision is made by the editor uh, and it, uh, after a, a close consultation in the traditional process, right? You have the editor invites reviewers, the reviewers respond, and then the editor makes the decision to either publish the paper eventually or to 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 reject it. But that entire process is closed, and then there is some. I mean, what is uh, this is sometimes seen as gatekeeping that you keep that paper in a closed in a closed system in a closed bottle if you like for about a year be be before it moves on and so that is seen as a kind of a gatekeeping whereas of course if you move to a system where the preprint is published first and then immediately the editor who can still play a role as editor but then invites peer reviewers and those peer reviews are published alongside the, the article in good time you have a much more open system that doesn't practice that kind of closed bottle um uh, system that we that 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 we had in the in the traditional system and which I'm still practicing. Huh? So, uh, uh, do, do you see, do you see what I mean now? Is that is it clear? Or is it I not? do. Yes. Not Thank you very clear. much. That was helpful. Okay. okay. Great. Um, uh, yeah, Marjolaine, I, are you aware of similar consultations to take peer review into account in other places than Europe, America, and China? Not really, actually. I mean, certainly not America. I mean, they're like way behind as far as I know. China, I don't know. It's. Do, are you aware of any initiatives in China about this? I don't think I am. Um, no, but the the question was more that if if in if in Europe we encourage this system, but in other places it's it's still the the former system that is encouraged. Then when when researchers shared publications and, and, and co-author publication, it could be a problem. Yes. Yes, that, that's that's true. At the same time, there are some encouraging signs that uh, also in NIH, for instance, is moving towards more uh, a more preprints and an open, more open system. I mean, one of the so recently. So, yeah, I, I, I think there will be, there, there could ultimately be convergence, but somebody has to lead, right? And I think we are, trying to lead here um so uh, helios and the, dora yes but helios is yeah dora is of course worldwide it's not just in the us and and helios is is not let's say as active i believe as as koara is uh and they're not indeed focusing on peer review incentives specifically so this is really in that sense we are yeah we are uh, we, we are specific. Note also that within Koara, there is um, there is a group that I'm uh, a member of that is trying to stimulate, that is trying to uh, formulate new um, recognition and rewards for uh, for peer review. Uh, and those recommendations are now in a draft stage and will be will be open for consultation sometime in the fall. So that's going to be interesting to see how people respond to that. Now, of course, these are just recommendations to institutions, to researchers, and to others. Um, but they're very much in line with what we are uh, what we are advocating here, namely that peer reviews need, need to be taken much more seriously. Um, I'm not sure whether this is the case at PCI, but uh, for instance, in my own practice as an editor, I find it harder and harder to find peer reviewers. And this is simply because it's not rewarded, uh, especially since COVID. For some reason, it's become harder and harder to find uh, to find reviewers for papers. Uh, so we. <laughs> 
I mean, even even in a very selfish way as editors, we need to change the system and make sure that reviews are better rewarded because otherwise the entire system could come to a screeching halt. Uh, um, if I have information about arguments of responses against open peer review, yes, the 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 um, arguments against open peer review are often, I mean. It's actually an argument that I endorse, in, in, especially in closed communities or in small communities. Uh, one of the things that you need to be careful about is about power differentials between individuals. So imagine if you, uh, you make signing peer reviews obligatory, right? Then, and in small, in small research communities, I'm not talking in the life sciences, but in small research communities, my typical example is always the formal semantics of Mayan languages. I mean, there's like 10 practitioners who all know each other. If in such a community, you just practice open peer review with everything signed, then you're going to create power differentials between senior researchers and junior researchers with the junior researchers, depending on the senior researchers for their jobs and for their job, for their job, uh, um, perspectives right because everybody is on each other's committees and uh, and so this is something you want to avoid so that that is probably where unsigned peer reviews is is, is more indicated in smaller communities so th these are aspects that one takes needs to take into account and and manage very carefully this is another discussion that i think we should we should have very carefully about you know that because some people think that signed peer reviews is the be all and end all that that is what the system should tend towards always. I think I disagree with that. I think in some cases there's very good reasons to have unsigned peer reviews, especially in view of these power differentials that you may have in smaller communities. So it's not against open peer reviews, it's just that it's not, I think open peer review should not be a one size fits all. I think that we should be very, very careful about certain social aspects of, uh, of, of open peer review. But again, this is this is a personal view, so uh, this is feel free to disagree with it. <laughs> um, um, do I think, is it Richard? Uh, do Richard? Do you, I think peer review should be regarded for every article and standardized, or should it be more flexible? Oh, I think we should be flexible, <laughs> as you know. Uh, ensuring work is accurate, but peer review, as currently review uh, performed, does not really achieve this. And a more long-term continuous process is needed. Yes, definitely, we need a we need a more long-term continuous process. We also need, I think, variety or allow for variety in peer review. I don't think it's possible to review an article in biology in the same way as you review an article in linguistics because the fields are different, the kind of argumentation is different. So I think you need to develop di discipline-specific. Uh, structures uh, for peer review. One of the things we did at uh, my journal, for instance, is to provide users with a form with nine questions that could guide their uh, their peer review. And many, many uh, reviewers find that extremely helpful. But of course, in other fields, this might be completely different, especially in fields where, you know, articles are much more uh, data driven and uh, written according to a specific format that requires a very different approach to 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 reviewing, whereas in linguistics, for instance, and in other fields, in the social sciences and humanities, uh, papers are much more discursive and so need a different kind of approach in the way they are that they are reviewed. So I don't think it's again, I don't think it's one size fits all. But all this work needs to be done. We need to agree uh, on a discipline based uh, uh, from a discipline based perspective to adapt peer review according and open peer review needs. To the, to, to the needs of the to, to the needs and the capacities and the social structures of the of the different communities. So this is a lot of work, but it needs to be done. Otherwise it's never going to succeed. People will simply not accept it. Uh, Diego, who seems coalition as is trying to push an agenda and hope that traditional journalism. Well, I'm not sure that that's true. Um, I think we do not want necessarily traditional journals to align. We just want the preprints. <laughs> uh, what you do with the article afterwards is is something else, right? I mean, of course, I, we want the preprint. We want the peer reviews to be open in the ideal scenario. And indeed, we want not necessarily traditional journals to align, but maybe other journals to align uh, with that. I mean, uh, of course, for-profit journals will constantly try to profit from new directions. 
but um that's not necessarily what we want my own uh, my own take on this i mean and that will not surprise you is that we should we should try to collaborate especially with diamond journals in this in this end because those are more most equitable we need to make sure that this is not a system that will develop that will impose new financial hurdles for authors and reviewers so this is very important and yes we will think about infrastructure that is necessary for uh for this this is something that we are actually working on now that i'm very actively uh, involved in in diamond access, open access journals i'm involved in the diamond capacity hub for europe and in the diamond alliance i can also announce already that the diamond alliance under the auspices of unesco will be officially announced on 10 10 of july we, that was decided yesterday so there will be a uh, an event for this purpose so do come <laughs> um so the, the 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 we are working at uh, you know global and regional and local infrastructure to make more diamond ac uh, uh, open access journals possible but of course this this cannot be done overnight uh and yes the uh, emphasis will be uh, on not-for-profit there um there, there was a question by Patsy Patsy Ziller just oh yeah sorry i skipped that probably okay. is there any hope that editors of traditional journal will use open peer reviews in their decisions sorry it's something skipped yeah to publish yeah i i think again that needs to be a conversation with i don't i don't think i'm not sure that traditional journals will want to do this but i do think that diamond open access journals will want to do this i mean I would be very happy for there to be, you know, a preprint, um, a preprint plus review service that I then can go look, go uh, look at and look at the peer reviews and look at the, uh, the the articles and see if that article is compatible with Glossa. For me, then to give it the Glossa, uh, the the Glossa stamp of approval, so to speak. I I would love to be a PCI friendly <laughs> journal if there was a PCI for linguistics. Uh, so I, I I think this is something that 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 can be done. Uh, it's just that, you know, I only have two hands and 24 hours in a day. Otherwise, I would do this. Uh, how can we do this? Yeah, yeah by, by talking to Diamond Open Access Journals, the, which are, I think, much more flexible than traditional um, commercial journals in, in doing this, that are not subject to all this the, the nonsense and, and norms that, uh, that commercial journals impose on us. Uh, and so these are conversations that can be had with, with more easily, I think, with diamond journals because they are journals that, that are much closer to the community. But again, overcome the hurdles means, you know, create the infrastructure, uh, cre and 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 create time and 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 provide money for people to be able to talk. Because I mean, you know, the, the, this needs to be built. This needs to, and this needs to be socialized, and that requires an effort and time and 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 an organization. Yeah, an organization. So uh, I don't see why an editor would refuse to open, use open peer review and, and start from scratch. I mean, if the article is good and the article is it makes a contribution, I would love to give it my stamp of approval. Um, uh, and I think I could convince a number of editors in Diamond Journal, the, the ones that are united uh, in, uh, under the, the organization that I call, that's called Lingoa, to do that. I don't see any problem. But again, I mean, this, 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 this takes time um is there are them did i skip anything else there was there was a last question by you at the end if open peer review is mostly unsigned anonymized how could the reviews re be rewarded for their work related to re yes irini this is a good question um uh, this is I, and this is something that actually has occupied me because like i said i mean I, for the reasons that I explained, I think unsigned peer reviews can 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 help socialize the system. I I'm, I really believe in that because people are really still very afraid and concerned about the backlash that they may experience by signing their reviews. So what I think we need to do is create an infrastructure where people can use nicknames for their reviews. So, and if they allow, if if there is that nickname can then be used for the annual reviews at their institution, or that can, it can be provided to the funder that is funding them, so that the they the the that and it's it's verifiable, right? It's something that is verifiable. So the nickname could then lead to the review and reveal to the funder or to the university that this is the person who who wrote those reviews. So in that sense, it can be it can be made it, it can be made useful for research assessment, 
And I think it's also useful to see, for instance, I mean, Im imagine you said, oh, uh, you know, re reviewer Mickey Mouse, for instance, take a nickname, uh, uh, and you look at all their reviews and you can actually see what the contributions they make because people, this is something that I've experienced as an editor, people have a certain style in their reviews. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, I'm sure that's true for Denis and Thomas as well. You, you, at, after a while, you know who the good reviewers are and you solicit them a lot and you see that they, and the good reviewers mean that they have a certain style. They have a certain way in, in, in which to make suggestions, in, may, in ways in which, to, in which to make the paper better. better. And I always find it uh, a pity, in fact, that this is not something that, that is made visible and that, that you cannot see that somewhere, what the contribution is that someone made as a peer reviewer. And a nickname system would make that possible. You could go to the nickname and you man, nickname Mickey Mouse and see what kind of contribution that person has made to, to, various, to, to various articles. Uh, I think that would be a much more, um, yeah, a, a much better system than the system that we have now, even if it's not ideal in the sense that the name is perhaps not known. But it, it at least as an as as a step, it would it would help. But again, that needs infrastructure that allows for these things. So you have to have, you have to be able to link a nickname to a to a real name in a system that is that is managed by 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 some organization. And again, that is something something. Uh, yeah, useful. Johan, uh, yeah. it was an effort, so, but it's, there's a last question by Guillaume, and I, I actually, I, I would be very pleased to Guillaume answer. Guillaume Tescous, yeah. What is your advice to young researchers who are time and, attempted by Diamond Away Publishing, but need, still need to publish, oh yeah, mm -hmm. if they want to survive in the current system. Ha, you know what I'm going to answer, right? Flip that journal to Diamond Open Access. <laughs> I mean, this is what we did with Glossa, right? We took a very prestigious journal. We moved it to Diamond Open Access with the entire community. Um, so, you know, as a re as a young researcher, exert pressure on the, those people in those high impact journals and tell them that they are on the wrong side of history and that, it should, that they should flip the journal to Diamond Open Access. We are now building the infrastructure that will make that possible. You, you know, when I flipped uh, Lingua, the journal Lingua, to the journal uh, Glossa, there was there was very little infrastructure available and there was no roadmap of, on how to do this. And I always uh, wanted to, to build this and to say, basically what we want to do is to say, look, to a journal editor, look, we have all the infrastructure available for you to flip tomorrow the to Diamond Open Access. Here it is. You know, you do the same things that you used to do. You just don't do it for a commercial publisher. You do it for Diamond Open Access. And that needs social pressure. So that what, what I would say is young researchers can put the older researchers at the prestigious journal under pressure to say, look, do the right thing, be on the right side of history and flip to Diamond Open Access. Let's take back the initiative. I, I know that's a bit idealistic, but you know we have to start somewhere. And if young researchers don't do this, uh, I mean, the system is never going to change. So, so I, I'm a strong believer in flipping the traditional journals and using their prestige to make a new journal that carries over that prestige, because that is what we did. We basically changed even the title of the journal, but the entire community joined us and the old journal uh, is still alive, but it's completely invisible. So this is something that we can that we can do and that we can affect, uh, I believe, even if it's... So that's my advice to young researcher Guillaume, uh, if I may be so blunt. Thanks a lot, Johan.